big The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on the Russ Belleville Show are their own, and the Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. Yeah! From the promise of legalization. Of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Yeah, I hear you. You had a question for me. Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. We love it. Good day, Tokens and Tokens. Welcome to the show. It is Tuesday, May 14th, 2013, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. It's also the end of my worst year ever. Yay! It's a long story. We'll talk about it in hour two. Coming up on today's show, I'm really excited about having our guest on today. It's Lindsay Reinhart from the Idaho Three, also from Compassionate Idaho. You remember we covered her story of her kids being taken by Child Protective Services because of her medical use of cannabis for multiple sclerosis. The great news we have is, of course, she's got her kids back, so we are very, very happy about that. Yes. And uh, she'll be joining us at half past to talk about it, uh, tell us about what's going on on the criminal phase, uh, if there's going to be a criminal phase of this investigation, and uh, anything else that she can tell us. Uh, so join us at uh, half past with Lindsay Reinhart from Compassionate Idaho. And thanks to all of you in the 420 Radio no Nation who donated to her legal defense fund. I know that went a long way toward getting the positive results that she's getting. They saw the, the muscle being flexed by the community, and uh, they didn't want to have to put up with the white hot spotlight uh, of of truth and uh, on them and the the support of all of us here uh, all around the world who helped out so thank you so much for being a part of that also on today's show we have got uh, time for a radical rant I, I was reading this story about a study on post traumatic stress disorder and the use of cannabinoids in the treatment of that and one of the findings from this leads me to believe that my hypothesis that we stoners aren't just people who like to smoke pot we are a people Deserving of protection from discrimination. There's evidence in this in this story about PTSD that backs up my hypothesis. We'll talk all about that at the end of the show. Also on today's show, we're going to go behind the headlines. An interesting headline out of the World Anti-Doping Agency, which is relaxing its standards for uh, testing positive for cannabinoids. And uh, we'll talk about that and how the U.S. Drug Czar's office pokes their nose into sports business. Also, we've got Bacon Dan calling us up. He's going to be bringing us a new tune for our Electric Tuesday from the Blue Man Group. I love the Blue Man Group. This is going to be great. Also, we got our 420 radio headlines coming up. Uh, Vermont has become the 17th state to decriminalize and plenty more news coming up right after this. Stick around. You're listening to the Russ Belville Show. You cut people, you smoke trees till you get what you need now. Designer drugs and mint is most to get through the day. You always get them so high. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Rust Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Rust Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. I'm Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger. At TGAgenetics.com, we are working on the leading edge of medical strains. Our strains are rigorously tested for THC, CBD, 
THCV, and other critical cannabinoids. Know your grow. Check out our genetic diversity at TGAgenetics.com. The home of Jelly Bean, Jack the Ripper, Vortex, and other award-winning cannabis strains. This is your 420 Radio News for Tuesday, May 14th, 2013. I'm Russ Belville. Vermont decriminalizes possession of marijuana from rawstory.com. Vermont's legislature on Monday voted to decriminalize possession of small amounts of marijuana, making the New England state the 17th to relax restrictions on the drug. The House of Representatives followed an earlier vote in the state Senate in favor of the measure, and Governor Peter Shumlin, a strong supporter, is expected to sign it into law. The law would decriminalize possession of up to one ounce of marijuana and also five grams of hashish, although a civil penalty similar to a traffic fine would still be imposed. The Marijuana Policy Project, a pro-marijuana reform group, said Vermont was now the 17th state to decriminalize or outright legalize what it says is a soft drug. Republican lawmaker to propose major amendment to marijuana legalization bill from Bangor Daily News. The face of a bill that would clear the way for legalizing recreational marijuana in Maine could change drastically Tuesday at the hands of a Republican-led amendment at the committee level. Republican Corey, or Representative Corey Wilson, Republican of Augusta, said he will present an amendment to direct the Commissioner of Administrative and Financial Services to collect bids through a competitive process for the intent of awarding up to 10 contracts statewide for the cultivation of marijuana. Any marijuana production not sanctioned through a contract with the department would remain illegal, which would be a change from Portland Democratic Representative Diane Russell's original bill. Russell's proposal would allow the cultivation of as many as six plants under certain restrictions. Wilson's amendment also would direct the commissioner to collect bids for a single statewide distribution service. New York City marijuana arrests drop, as do NYPD stop and frisks from Huffington Post. Efforts to decriminalize marijuana in New York City, the pot arrest capital of the world, seem to be paying off. The New York Post parsed data from the State Division of Criminal Justice Services to find that arrests for small amounts of weed are on pace to drop 20% in 2013. Marijuana possession in 2013, however, still remained the number one reason for an arrest in New York City. In 2012, arrests for small amounts of bud dropped 22% to 40,661 from 52,220 in 2011. Citywide, the number of police stops dropped by 22% in 2012. From 2002 to 2012, the NYPD spent 1 million hours making 440,000 arrests for low-level marijuana possession charges, according to another report from the Drug Policy Alliance and the Marijuana Arrest Research Project, released in March. And in January, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo proposed decriminalizing quantities of marijuana under 15 grams. As the Post notes, had Cuomo's plan been under effect last year, it would have nullified over 39,000 of the over 40,000 low-level marijuana arrests in New York. Not so fast. Tax revenue estimates from legal marijuana may not materialize from Huffington Post. In a widely cited study of Colorado's Amendment 64, the Colorado Center on Law and Policy predicted that marijuana legalization would produce $60 million annually in new revenue and savings for the state each year until 2017. The $60 million estimate is still being discussed, but a more recent study tempered expectations. The Colorado Futures Center at Colorado State University concluded that while revenue will be raised, it may not meet the state's expectations. The report concluded that for the tax to raise the $40 million anticipated for schools, given current consumption estimates, the cost to grow a pound of marijuana would be in the range of $1,100 a pound, almost twice earlier estimates. That level risks raising the price of retail marijuana so high that it could send users back to the black market. Two more cruise passengers in Bermuda find over marijuana from USA Today. A reminder for Americans planning a cruise to Bermuda, leave the marijuana at home. The island destination's reputation for being tough on tourists found with illegal substances was reinforced this week after a judge ordered stiff penalties for two cruisers found with small amounts of the drug. 
In separate cases on Monday, two men aged 53 were ordered to pay $1,000 in fines or face 100 days in jail after cannabis was found in their cabins on Norwegian Cruise Line's Norwegian Dawn. Possessing marijuana is illegal in Bermuda. In 2011, a passenger arriving on the Norwegian Dawn with about 23 grams was ordered to pay a $10,000 fine, and another cruiser caught with marijuana earlier that year was fined $3,000. This has been your 420 Radio News for Tuesday, May 14th, 2013. I'm Russ Belville. When we come back, we go behind the headlines and take a look at the World Anti-Doping Agency lowering its threshold, excuse me, raising its threshold for a positive test for marijuana for sports athletes. You're listening to the Russ Belville Show on 420radio.org. We'll be right back. medical marijuana right for you? When you are stricken by an illness, injury, or disability, you deserve to live your life as free from pain and suffering as possible. Modern medical researchers have developed some amazing pharmaceutical drugs, but these may not be the best solution for you. At Alternative Medical Choices, we help collect your medical records history and provide a physician's review and examination to help you qualify for the use of medical marijuana in Oregon and Washington State. Call 971-270-0262 or visit altmedchoices.com for more information and to schedule an appointment today. Alternative Medical Choices, because you deserve the best in health care. I'm going to call a little bit of an audible here because I got one of my good friends calling up and I will always answer the phone when he calls. It's Michael Kravitz from Veterans for Medical Cannabis Access. Michael, are you there? I am, Russ. And indeed, I was trying to call during the break. That's so okay. Man. What's happening? You got me right on time. It was right during the break. But, uh, yeah, I just wanted to call and uh, touch base with you on the pet, uh, veterans issues that are uh, you know popping up in the news. Yeah, you know, uh, at the end of the show today, I've got a rant about this new study they're doing on uh, a cannabinoid, uh, this cannabinoid study for uh, PTSD, and they did some brain imaging that's uh, really telling. So, uh, yeah, I hope you get to hear that. Sure. So what's uh, what's new with you and uh, the Veterans for Medical Cannabis Access? Well, we have a recent success to report for New Mexico where we uh, kind of... Uh held the scrimmage line, I guess you could say. I'm not a big football fan, but I think that's, that's right. It. They were trying to get rid of PTSD there in New Mexico, and you guys managed to keep it uh, as one of the conditions. Absolutely, and uh, now we're fighting in Oregon uh, to add post-traumatic stress. It's a little overshadowed by the other bills, which are uh, maybe a little bit more interesting, a little bit more uh, uh, wide-scale affecting, uh, you know, legalization, decriminalization, stuff like that. But uh, we also have... Uh, a, a bill to add post-traumatic stress to Oregon state law to get around the mired mess that the uh, you know, the oversight panel has has become. Yeah, absolutely, and and we're just finding more and more states now that are are looking to add uh, post-traumatic stress as 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 a qualifying condition. Uh, I believe is it Delaware, one of the new states that just uh, came online, has PTSD as one of their conditions. Yep, Delaware, and also in Massachusetts, even though it doesn't list uh, post-traumatic stress, it really doesn't list anything. It allows doctors to uh, recommend cannabis the way they prescribe other drugs, which is based on medical standards, not on some oversight from a legislative committee. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so the things are looking up as far as that goes, and you know, we know uh, the, the study I was, I was reading said that uh, some 20% of our veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan are, are designated, or designated with post-traumatic stress, so uh, this could be a huge change for us. Absolutely, and, and I think that there's some general consensus emerging on some very important issues to us with regard to medical marijuana and veterans, and that is, you know, one of the most common arguments against our, you know, issue of, of uh, you know, allowing people to have uh, medical marijuana is, is, oh, well, that's not the best medicine, or that's not the only medicine, or we have this great pharmacy full of medicine to use, and that that just really is a, a, a very, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, 
it's almost an insulting mm -hmm. statement to make when you're talking about veterans and medical cannabis access because there is no other medicine that works like cannabis for vets. And the, the, the problem is we have uh, just a couple of medicines that are actually approved that don't work well. And then they wind up doctors prescribing all kinds of medicines that really are counterproductive. Uh, if you look at the side effects, they even promote suicide in their in their side effects. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are not the medicines you want to be giving to people for post traumatic stress. And yet, that that's the medicines that you know, by and large, veterans are being given. Uh, as Phil Northcutt you know, put it out there in California, he went to the VA to give him a big bag full of pills and told him to go home and feel better. Jeez. Yeah, it's it's terrible. So we'll talk more about that at the end of the show. And um, Michael, I got to run. If you can, if you want, uh, call in in our second hour. We can discuss this further after my rant. I uh, got a few news stories I got to get to though. Sounds great. I'll do that. All right. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. We'll be right back with a little behind the headlines. Stick around. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show. Yeah, we've made a call uh, on the controversial marijuana ballot question, Amendment 64. Floyd, uh, we can safely say this is going to pass. It is legal in the Constitution to possess and grow up to six plants. You cannot be arrested for being in possession of an ounce of marijuana. in the state of Washington, they voted to legalize marijuana, not for medical use, but for recreational use. <laughs> this is the beginning of taking apart prohibition one state at a time. That's how they did it 80 years ago against alcohol. That's how we're going to do it now against marijuana. Welcome back, everybody. Time to go behind the headlines. And in today's story, I was taking, taking a look at this news from the World Anti-Doping Agency, which has raised its threshold for a positive marijuana test. This is going to significantly reduce the chances that an athlete competing in the Olympic stage at the world level uh, is going to fail because of cannabis. Uh, under the anti-doping policy enacted in 2008, cannabinoids are considered recreational and not performance enhancing. Unless you're in the Nathan's hot dog eating contest, then it's a whole other thing. Uh, now, in, on May 12th, this was uh, just yesterday, they met with their executive committee and foundation board in Montreal, and World Anti-Doping Agency came up with some final revisions, uh, which will be updated in 2015. So this is going to go in effect in 2015, and they're increasing. Check this. Now, understand we are talking about THC CU, or carboxy THC, the metabolite in your pee. This has nothing to do with what you hear in Washington State or other states as far as THC in blood. Whole nother, whole nother thing. But what they're going to do is they're going to raise the standard from 15 nanograms per milliliter to 150 nanograms per milliliter. This means athletes who use marijuana weeks or months before an event would be far less likely to test positive under the revised threshold than those who would use the drug in the hours or days before competition. Ten times greater threshold because the World Anti-Doping Agency is tired of having to boot great athletes just because they smoked a joint a week or a month ago. Just makes no sense. And if it were up to them, it sounds as if marijuana wouldn't even be on the list at all. Uh, you may have heard of Dick Pound. Yes, that's his name. He's a very famous sports lawyer, Dick Pound. He was an attorney who was the uh, World Anti-Doping Agency's initial chief. He was the, the first head of this agency. And in 2003, when they made the original prohibited substances list, he was really ambivalent toward it. His quote, from a sports perspective, I was rather ambivalent toward marijuana. As we morphed into the World Anti-Doping Agency, the USA was very keen to have it included. End quote. Yes, it's American sports officials that lobbied the world, just like, you know, Anslinger lobbied the world back in the 60s to pass all of those those awful treaties, lobbied the world to go along with America's prohibition of marijuana to send a message to the kids because, by God, we couldn't have our athletes like Michael Phelps winning 22 gold medals and then showing up in a bong photo. Now, uh, during, in March, when they were uh, during the consulting phase on this 2015 code review, Edward Jurith who is the senior counsel for the drug czar's office, urged that marijuana remain on the list of prohibited substances. And on another level, at the NCAA level, the U.S. college level, rather than increasing their threshold by a factor of 10, 
They've reduced it by a factor of three. The NCAA is reducing their positive threshold from 15 nanograms per milliliter to five nanograms per milliliter. It'll be impossible to be a college athlete and not get caught on your pee test unless you're really, really good at doing the flush and detox. Just two different directions the world and the U.S. are going here. I say let them smoke. It's madness, people. Absolute madness. What better way for an athlete to relax with an anti-inflammatory, anti-stress, anti-anxiety? Neuroprotective. Ah. Yeah, especially for the football players. Boom. All these guys with concussive head injuries, they could use this neuroprotectant. Yeah. Well, we better use a little neuroprotectant ourselves. We'll be right back. He would send you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. Ever wonder how often to change your bong water? The most effective method for baking pot brownies? The best destinations for a ganja getaway. How to hide herb in your car, whether to grow your own, how precisely to legalize it, or how something as wonderful as marijuana ever got to be illegal in the first place. Finally, you can find all these answers and much more in the official High Times Pot Smokers Handbook, featuring 420 things to do when you're stoned. Since 1974, High Times Magazine has covered marijuana in all its aspects and wonders, from cultivation to legalization to the herbs enduring and exalted place in popular culture. Packed with inside information, the official High Times Pot Smokers Handbook rolls all of this collected wisdom together into a single indispensable ganja guide, including an entertaining look at marijuana's history, profiles of herb-friendly travel destinations and festivals, favorite potluck recipes from the High Times staff, smoking skills, advocacy and activism, essential marijuana movies and songs, profiles of famous cannabis strains, comprehensive growing information, celebrity endorsements, and much more. This is truly, finally, the ultimate guide to green living. Bong, bong, bong. Big Daddy music and marijuana go together so let's wind up our 20 after break with the russ belleville show's daily toker tunes the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web today is electric tuesday featuring the latest in electronic dance music and other cutting edge genres you can get downloads and more information about all our daily toker tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com now sit back and enjoy your daily toker tunes Time for a little Electric Tuesday music. It doesn't get much more electric than our next artist, the Blue Man Group, the performance art troupe. Uh, I do believe they still have a show going in Las Vegas. They've been there forever. Really amazing stuff they do, kind of transforming everyday objects and some not-so-everyday objects into musical instruments and a really visual interesting show that they put on our our good man bacon crispy aka bacon dan uh comes up with this stuff for us and if you've got any electric tuesday music that you'd like to submit uh if you're a producer an artist like to get some music heard on our show you can go to our contact form at 420 radio.org just 420 radio.org slash contact use the drop down box there to select which type of music i think do I have the types? Maybe I think I just have music submissions as one, but uh, we'll get it all worked out. There'll be a way to get in touch with us. Send your music in, and we'll help promote your artists. Also, uh, if you'd like to promote yourself, you know, you can always call into the show. Uh, as you can tell from earlier today, we accept call-ins. So uh, let's get this playing a little Blue Man group with Time to Start. It's time to start. Rock concert movement number one. The basic head bob. Ready, go. Concert movement number two, the one-armed fist pump. 
Rico. This is a banana. This is a cat. This is fire. This is harmless and actually helpful to some people. Don't believe everything you hear. The fact is that every major health organization rejects smoked marijuana. Now that the smoke is cleared, discover truecompassion.org. Are you or is someone you know a marijuana smoker? Have you or is someone in your family been arrested for a marijuana violation? You need to know the truth about pot. Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, is the most comprehensive source of information regarding marijuana and its effects on health as well as legal issues. Normal even offers a database of lawyers specializing in cannabis in your area. Normal, the nation's largest and most successful marijuana law reform organization, has spent decades gathering the knowledge and science on everything related to cannabis. Normal is the best resource to find out the truth about marijuana, connect with a lawyer in your area, or help find an end to prohibition. Information is available at normal.org, that's N-O-R-M-L dot org, or toll free at 888-67-NORMAL. Activism begins with ACT. The Rush Belleville Show features the stories of hardworking, grassroots activists working for an end to prohibition in today's activist agenda. Welcome back, everybody. So glad to have my next guest with us, the uh, chief petitioner of the Idaho Medical Choice Act and the head of Compassion in Idaho. We've got Lindsay Reinhardt on the line. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, How are you? 
a lot better since my children are home. That's right, your children are home. <laughs> Crowd went nuts for that. So can you tell us how that went down? And when did it happen? Um, it started to go down Thursday. We found out that the judge would be um, more than likely signing on the paperwork saying that we could have the kids back. But we definitely didn't want to cause any problems with the judge or give him any reason not to sign the paperwork. And so we just had to keep our mouths shut for a minute. And then Thursday, they signed paperwork and we got our kids back. Like they were already in our care. So um, they just let us keep them. Because <laughs> right. right, we're their parents. Now, you had, you had received what felt like, or at least, you know, on my cursory knowledge of it, uh, really unprecedented. Uh, uh, help from the child protective services in this whole ordeal i mean you were getting visits way before people usually get them can you explain that a little yeah it was actually really neat um my social worker was incredibly kind and so um they recognized that josh and i were good parents immediately and because we interact with our children the way they would like to see mm -hmm. and um we, they could see that we had a strong family bond. I straight up admitted to them everything because they had discovery on me. There was no point in lying about it ever. Sure. And so it was easy to be open and honest. And um, the social worker could see that we were good parents. She came through and did a safety plan with us, checked out our house. I showed her everything that was a matter of concern. And then um, she came back. This last Thursday, before they give the kids back, it's for us to give her some more paperwork. And I actually asked her if she would please come look at my house again, um, even though she didn't need to, so I could re-show her that it was still in the same condition she'd seen it the week before and that everything was fine. And I'd gone grocery shopping and had my our house stuffed full of food. And, I mean, she was just really gracious with us. She said that it was basically us doing our job right that got our kids back as fast as we did. That's fantastic news, and we're so glad to hear it. Now, Lindsay, you know, this, this story got a lot of local news coverage. I mean, I, I covered it, you know, saw everything that came up on KTVB and so forth, and the Boise Weekly, Idaho Statesman, Idaho Press Tribune, but also went, you know, viral, kind of went out to, you know, the Daily Mail in London picked it up, and uh, the Russia Today picked it up, lots of uh, international focus on this case. Do you think the, the heavy media focus on this had anything to do with the way your case turned out? I think so. I absolutely think so. They're used to parents being quiet. When you get your kids taken away, most parents feel ashamed. They feel like they've done something wrong, and they don't. It, it's like a dirty secret, and you don't want people to know that your kids have been removed because then you're judged. Um, with us, we were vocal from the minute we found out, mm -hmm. and so it was kind of a backwards way for them to, to have to look at things. So definitely, I think the pressure. Um, Reason TV is even interested in, in doing a story on this. So um, I think with all the media pressure, it, it did probably help move things along because we weren't the parents that, I mean, and I'm not saying anything bad against parents that keep their mouth shut and do exactly what the social worker says. But um, we have a good lawyer and he let me very freely exercise my right to free speech. And mm -hmm. so I think it was definitely something they weren't used to seeing. Excellent. So uh, we'll move from the great news of you know getting your kids back right before Mother's Day too. How was that? Oh my gosh, I mean it's the best Mother's Day ever. You know, like it's kind of messed up that your kids for Mother's Day has to be a present, but <laughs> you couldn't ask for a better one when your kids have been gone for seventeen days. So we basically had like a Mother's Day weekend. Um, where it was just this constant happy Mother's Day. Even my mom came down and brought me flowers, and she was two hours away oh, and wow. came and saw the kids. And so it was really good. We we actually really enjoyed this last weekend because it was our boys were home. They were in their own beds. We could hear them laughing. We could hear them fighting. You know, <laughs> like it was really nice to just have them home. How beautiful. All right, let's move to uh, where you're at presently and as far as the future holds, because the the children part of it while it's the most terrifying and harrowing part of the ordeal was just one part of the ordeal. There's still the possibility of criminal charges going on here. Can you update us on the case and what it looks like so far? I wish. 
Huh. <laughs> um, the thing is, is they haven't charged me with anything. And so it's just this, this, I mean, clearly, I am not out to provoke the Boise Police Department to come charge me criminally. Sure. At the same time, um, we're grateful that they haven't. Um, we're in the process of doing um, temporary guardianship papers with people in case they come arrest us. Mm-hmm. I've been warned that they could fight, they could arrest. Um, we're not sure on what charges. Um, again, we certainly don't want to ask them to come do those things, but it's nerve-wracking. I mean, I don't know that Ada County website has ever been used that much, ever, because I check for a warrant every five hours. I'm in a constant panic attack. I, yeah. don't, I don't want the officers to come to my house and arrest me and front of my children who have already been through enough. Yeah, really. So it hurts. certainly hope that if they were going to do charges, that they would call my lawyer or call us and that we'd have the opportunity to go turn ourselves in or do whatever we need to do so they can keep the kids stupid again. Yeah, let's hope so. And you you mentioned the temporary guardianship papers, and this is something that now uh, Moms for Marijuana, Normal Women's Alliance, uh, the the women's organizations are starting to really pay attention to and counsel their members that are that are parents that if you are involved, especially if you're an activist, you need to have this plan for what happens if you get arrested. Can, can you explain that a little bit to people? So the temporary guardianship. Basically, you you put down on there where you like would like your children to go in case of an emergency. It doesn't have to be arrested. It could be that you're at a car wreck, you had to go to the hospital, whatever. I mean, any sort of option where your children could possibly be removed from your house. And so you do a piece of paper, you know, very simple. You can write out your own whatever that you feel like. The person that I'm writing mine out to um, has agreed to stay in my house, for instance, if, if anything were to happen, so that they could watch my kids and my animals here. Um, and so basically just write down somebody that you really trust because those are your kids. Um, and basically I've always looked at it like you don't leave your kids with anybody that you can leave a stack of a million dollars on your table and come back and not find one dollar missing. And mm-hmm. I have that friend. Yeah. I have a few of them. And so um, you fill it out, your your terms, whatever it is that you deem them. And so we've got a plan where our friend would stay here and also that my mom could take over guardianship as well. And so we have to take that to a notary. And you go and you notarize the paper saying, this is what I want done with my children in case of an emergency. Please don't place them in foster care. Please place them with this friend or this relative or whoever it's going to be. And... Um, you get it notarized, you retain a copy of it. The person that is going to take the guardianship retains a copy of it. And then um, if there's a, a situation where your children are in danger of being taken, then you can provide documentation saying, no, you're not going to take these children. They have somewhere to go already. Yeah, very, very good thing. Uh, and, of, of course, folks, if you're listening and you and this is interesting to you, uh, get in touch with an attorney. Uh, Normal.org has a list of, of attorneys that are, you know, very cognizant of what's going on with marijuana and all that. But uh, any good, decent attorney, family law should be able to ha- handle this kind of a, a situation. And there might there might even be online resources to do this on your own in some states. So uh, there should be a lot of uh, uh, options available. If you've got any questions, uh, send me an email, russ at radicalrust.com. I'll see what I can do to point you in the right direction. Lindsay, there's one other aspect I wanted to ask you about, and that, of course, is what got you in this spot in the first place, your medical use of cannabis for the treatment of multiple sclerosis. And uh, when we last reported on you, you were talking about cooperating with CPS, cooperating with the authorities, and ceasing your use of cannabis for multiple sclerosis and returning to the pharmaceutical regimen. What's happening with that? How is that affecting you? And uh, how long should you have to suffer like this? I wish I didn't have to suffer like this at all, first of all. But um, I don't know. I mean, I've <laughs> I've sold prescriptions for three medications that I was off of. Um, I have to go back on my regular dose of the medication that keeps multiple sclerosis away if it's successful, which it's only like two-thirds successful. Okay. But it was being really, um, it was working on my system very well. So that was conjunction of cannabis. I was able to start taking that medication every other day. So I had more control over my own body and my own medicine. Um, since then, I've had to order that medication to um, have it be every day again. Um, I've had to go back on a few different medications. I have a couple on standby just because I can feel my body is, is not cooperating. 
Um, I have burning skin on various parts of my body during various times. There's no control over it. Um, muscle spasms that just come out of nowhere and leave when they feel like it. Mm-hmm. Multiple sclerosis is, 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 is it's an attack on your central nervous system. So basically any function of your body, um, it, it can just do whatever it wants. It wreaks havoc on your body. So I've had spasms, I've had burning, I've had weakness. And right now, fatigue is just taking me out. Um, it's just been really hard. I, 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 I don't even... It's hard. I I need the cannabis back, yeah. and, and I did agree to, to cooperate fully. So now we're in a really messy situation because I I mean I can feel the corner of my mouth starting to sag again. I can feel my eyebrow going down again. I can feel the disease creeping up again. I'm trying to keep cannabinoids in my body by using like uh, the hemp oil, supplemental oil, and eating hemp seeds because. That's the best legal option I can think of, mm-hmm. um, but it's it's not very pleasant. It's I'm getting sicker and sicker by the day, mm. and I I didn't expect for it to be this fast, but <laughs> it is. Wow, so and, I don't know. and of course, uh, you know. Cannabis has been working fantastically for you. It's it, I've seen you in person taking on so much. And, of course, uh, multiple sclerosis is a disease that reacts poorly with stress, if I'm not mistaken, right? Right. Yeah. yeah, so this is... Stress is a huge factor. Yeah, so this has not been easy for you, and I've and I've seen what remarkable results you've gotten for cannabis, and, and the state uh, would put you in such a situation where you have to go through a, a form of self-torture uh, just seems so insane and cruel, and that's why we're here every day continuing to fight to end this uh, adult marijuana prohibition. One more aspect of it that I would imagine is the cost of these drugs. Well, yeah. Um, thank God I, I I'm I'm on disability because I, I I my original plan was to be on disability until I could cure my MS or at least significantly cut it out of my life. Which I figured once I had it legal, then I could start juicing and I'd have RSO. And I figured with the combination of those things, I would cure it and then I could go back to the workforce. Mm-hmm. But um, now I'm I, they're basically keeping me disabled. So with that comes Medicare, and thank God for Medicare because my one drug to keep my MS away alone is five thousand dollars. Wow. That's how much cheaper in with those drugs. Five, and then great. you know the other eight medications that have to go with it. You're you're looking like at least six grand a month. Wow. And right now your taxpayer dollars are going hard at work to pay for a medication that if I could insist on less. That's alone, um, then this wouldn't even be happening. Well, and especially, you know, regardless of which political side of the aisle you come down on, there seems to be a lot of concern about overspending and the debt, and we have to do a sequestration, and we have to cut back on all of these expenses. And meanwhile, we're spending, like you say, six grand a month for your uh, your MS medications when a simple cannabis plant grown in the garden would alleviate most of those, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, with the with the cannabis, that five thousand dollar medication, I only need to fill it every sixty days instead of every thirty days. Mm-hmm. Um, I just ordered three new medications, all of which cost over a hundred dollars. One of which cost over two hundred wow. for a thirty day supply. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's it's pretty messy. I mean, if you if if I would have just been left alone, um, everybody's medical bills and taxpayer dollars could have gone to people that don't know to treat with cannabis or, um, you know, it, I was saving taxpayers money and now <laughs> we're using it. even more of it to investigate me and, yeah. you know, make my medical bill go up. And frankly, I don't know that, I know that the Lacey Police Department and other police departments around the state typically don't want to take multiple sclerosis patients because the bills are so high yeah. and they don't really have that in their budget. So to take a sick person and put them in jail, if they refuse me that $5,000 a month medication, they could wind up with somebody much sicker even. Sure. And then they don't want to deal with that. So then I go into a medical world board. And so, I mean, again, I'm not trying to provoke them, but I'm pretty expensive to arrest. Yeah. Wow. Uh, question coming from our chat room. They want to know, would you ever consider moving to one of the medical states? I see that. Um, I, um, yeah, I've considered it. I've considered it a thousand times. 
I have said from the beginning that we weren't giving up and we weren't going away, and that was until they stole my family. Yeah. So um, now I don't have the means to do so, but in the future, it looks like that would probably be the best option. Yeah. Um, but thank God we spent two and a half years building this network so there are strong, strong team leaders and a great network of activists that wouldn't give up. And I could still, you know, help. Um, Mm -hmm. I just wouldn't be in Idaho to do it. And then, you know, if I could move back to Idaho, maybe I would. Um, But basically, I don't want to leave the city right now because if you get a criminal charge and then you have to go back to face that criminal charge, which you've moved your whole family to a different state, then you're arrested with no support. Um, You know, and then coming back, and then it's scary. I mean... (laughs) There's a thing called the PTSD from Idaho, which is basically the, just the outright torture of different people that have been arrested for multiple things. And, you know, you, you do develop PTSD against Idaho. And so it's going to be really hard for me to decide to come back to the state if I leave. Yeah. Um, but I can't abandon Idaho. I can't let them just chase off a lead activist and have this really living in fear it's already and trying to calm people down and tell them they don't have to be scared they got who they wanted. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm just, I don't want to abandon anybody. I don't want to leave people that are in my exact situation to deal with this. This is exactly what we were fighting against. So, um, I'll stay here as long as I am able and, or, you know, am able to leave. And, um, of course, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to be present in a state to have an impact or an influence. Clearly, you've been in the state that times. They seem to know my name there in Idaho. <laughs> yeah. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> well, Lindsay, I want to thank you for coming on the show and updating people. Everybody's been so you know, interested in your story and and wishing all the best. And it looks like at least on the first and most important front, you know, keeping your family together, getting your boys back. We've got major good news. And it's so I'm so glad your family's back together and, you know, Every, anything we can do for you, we're always here. Thank you. And we're happy to have them back. And the kids are happy to have them back. I like to be back. And I've shown them different various ways of support, including um, perks of your show. And they're just so, like, my older son, my younger son, I don't really like to show it to you because he's too little, but my older son just thinks it's amazing that so many people care about him. And oh. so that really helps out too. That's wonderful. Well, hey, uh, before we let you go, uh, give folks any contact information, Facebooks, or any of that stuff they need if they want to uh, reach out to you directly. Okay, so if you want to email me, it's Lindsay Reinhart at CompassionateIdaho.org. You can go to CompassionateIdaho.org and uh, CompassionateIdaho.org and you can find my email address there. Um, I'm on Facebook. People can feel free to look me up right now. My profile picture is of my boys. Um, if they want to go to our Facebook page, we have the Compassionate Idaho page, and we also have the Idaho Free page, which is just meant for things like this going on with me, my family, and Sarah Caldwell's family. Um, and then if people want to help keep this from happening to other families, Compassionate Idaho needs funding, and we need it now. Um, and so there's a donate button at CompassionateIdaho.org on every page. And if people can press that button and start donating, um, we'd really like to make sure that this was taken care of because people should never have to go through this. Absolutely agreed. And, of course, we got the uh, Idaho Hope Fest coming up uh, end of September, right? Or 1st of September? When is it? End of September. Um, it looks like a tentative date for September 22nd back in Julia Davis Park where we belong. Good. So, uh, yeah, yay. I will see you so, there. Um, Thank you, Lindsay okay. Reinhardt, so much for calling in. We love you. All right, we come back. Time for a radical rant. You'll like. We'll this be one. right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Tokers, there's no good reason to get your dog stoned. While it might not harm them physically, imagine being a dog who already begs for treats all day 
and then imagine that dog having the munchies. Not cool. Yar, Darby Pirates here. Har, har, har. You want answers? I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. And you have offended a Shaolin temple. You can't handle the truth. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Hoorah! Radical Grant. For a long time, I've had this science fiction concept in my head, a novel maybe that I should write someday, you know, when I have some spare time. And uh, it had to do with what it would be like if marijuana consumption, and here was the setup, is that uh, the government, you know, trying to outlaw marijuana, trying to make sure they could bust people, comes up with a novel new way of genetically modifying cannabis so that anybody who smokes it would have a slight green tint to their skin. And the more that you smoked, the greener your skin would get, right? And uh, it backfires on them when, of course, people discover how many green people there are. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God, there's green people everywhere. And it led, led me to this, you know, thought experiment about, you know, marijuana smokers as a people, as, you know, not being discriminated against. And I've used this in civil rights arguments before where I've talked about, you know, the gay rights argument and the marijuana rights argument. A lot of the same parallels come out of the closet. Don't punish us for who we are. Or it's our bodies, what we do. People have the rights to be who we are. But that argument always gets hung up when people say, well, you know, you're not born a pothead. You know, you're born gay. You're born gay, and, and all but the most idiotic, you know, Westboro Baptist Church people will follow you on this. Or or black, right? You know, you're born black, right? But but marijuana, you choose to smoke marijuana. And that always kind of hamstrings my argument, although I do come back and say, look, we don't discriminate against people being Jewish or being Christian or being Muslim. I mean, <laughs> legally speaking, right? Uh, we have freedom of religion in this country, and we have very strong laws uh, prohibiting discrimination against religious choice. So we do recognize that who a person is, what makes a person's essence and identity can have a lot to do with things they choose, things they believe, freedom of thought, right? But this is kind of a tough argument to float with some people because they're still going to say, yeah, 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 but you're choosing to smoke dope. So this new study that I came upon, now of all places, this comes from Fox News. So I love it. <laughs> uh, this had to do with a, a headline is marijuana-like compound could lead to first ever medication for PTSD. And I went into this ready to rant on, yeah, see, you know, they're going to make a pill out of it. They're going to patent a pill instead of just letting them smoke weed. And that I've done that rant a million times. Digging into this a little deeper, though, I found something that was just, to me, mind blowing. <laughs> Pardon the pun and you'll find out why. Um. Here's the pro the problem is they say there's no pharmaceutical tre pharmaceutical treatments yet that have been developed for the treatment specific treatment of post traumatic stress. Now researchers at New York University's Langone Medical Center and I don't know if I pronounced that right uh, have utilized brain imaging technology to highlight a connection between the number of cannabinoid receptors in the brain and PTSD. Brain imaging technology. Check this. Out. The lead author of this study, Dr. Alexander Neumeister, who's the director of the Molecular Imaging Program in the Departments of Psychiatry and Radiology at New York University School of Medicine, said, quote, The first line of treatment for PTSD patients is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, which is a class of medication generally used with good effects in people with depression. These medications do not really do the job for PTSD, so clinicians... Use anything else that's legally available on the market. They often use different classes of medications developed for things like depression, schizophrenia, or bipolar disorder, and the overall consensus is these do not work. End quote. Now, PTSD affects about 8 million people in America. Uh, 1.7 million men and mil Of the 1.7 million American men and women in the military who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, about 20%, about 1 in 5, get diagnosed with PTSD. So this researcher, Dr. Neumeister, is, wants to test this idea because one thing that they find over and over and over again from people with PTSD is that they often report smoking cannabis. 
and say that smoking pot works better than any other legal medication they can get their hands on. So to test the idea, they used positron emission tomography, PET scans. They did PET scans on the brains of 60 participants who were divided into three groups. Those who had PTSD, those who had trauma but no PTSD, and those who didn't have trauma or PTSD. Right? Because it's interesting that, you know, we say one out of five vets comes back, you know, with PTSD. How is it that one guy serving alongside another guy on the front lines, seeing the same carnage, doing the same exact, you know, things, living the same exact life, why does one get PTSD and the other one doesn't? So they have that middle group, right? People that had trauma, but no PTSD. So check this out. This is paradigm changing. The images revealed what the researchers had expected. The individuals with PTSD had higher levels of CB1 receptors in the areas of the brain associated with fear and anxiety than the volunteers without PTSD. Those with PTSD also had lower levels of the neurotransmitter anandamide, an endocannabinoid that binds to CB1. Neumeister explained that lower levels of anandamide prompts the brain to compensate by increasing the number of CB1 receptors, resulting in an imbalanced endocannabinoid system. Because CB1 receptors help regulate mood and anxiety, the scientists advise against creating medications to destroy them, as that would lead to depression. Instead, Neumeister said their PTS medication would rely on promoting CB1 equilibrium. Neumeister claims the compound's very safe and does not come with the added health problems caused by chronic marijuana use. But let me go back to the other paragraph. Individuals with PTSD had higher levels of CB1 receptors in the areas of the brain associated with fear and anxiety. PTSD also showed people with lower levels of anandamide, our natural endocannabinoid. When we've been making jokes about needing to raise our endocannabinoid levels, these haven't been jokes. I believe this research is starting to show us that there are some of us whose brains are different. Some of us whose brains are wired differently. Some of us who do not have enough natural anandamide. Some of us that have too many CB1 receptors. And those of us that have that have found that using cannabis on a consistent basis keeps us in a nice state of equilibrium. This, to me, is as groundbreaking as discovering there are genetic links and brain differences between homosexual men and heterosexual men, where they find they have a, a, a greater, uh, uh, that, that pathway between the two hemispheres of the brain, they actually find it's larger in hem homosexual men. That they're finding that the way our brains are wired can determine whether we're gay or whether we're stoners. If we've got a certain segment of our population in the military and, and certain people that experience trauma and then get PTSD versus people who experience trauma and don't get PTSD, wouldn't that also suggest there is a difference between the people who don't experience trauma whatsoever but still may have different brains and have found different ways of compensating for that in their natural lives? I believe this. I believe that my brain is a differently wired brain than the average person. I think this explains why lots of people try pot when they're young, but only a few of us keep using pot when we get old. For those of people whose brains are wired normally, smoking pot makes them high. I don't feel high. I don't remember feeling high back in the first when I first smoked pot. You know what I felt? I felt normal. I felt the hypercritical voices in my head shut up for a while. I felt like I could actually go to sleep. You know, like everybody else ever told me, they could just go to bed and go to sleep. That blew my mind. How do you go to sleep? How do you turn your brain off? How do you make it stop talking to you all night? How do you stop thinking until it's four or five in the morning? I was just endocannabinoid deficient. <laughs> my brain is just wired differently. And when I use cannabis on a regular basis, I feel like you. I feel like everyone else, at least how they tell me they feel. Cannabinoid Deficiency Syndrome. Look it up. Ethan Russo, MD. You're right. Good stuff from our chat room. Hey, uh, we got to go. For Brian the Red, I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned. Hour 2 is next. And until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. 
The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down.